welcome to the Three Steps to Kayaking. Uh, I am recording this call. Welcome, my name is Hans. I'm a longtime track pilot, a sea kayaker, director of development at Track Kayaks. And I'll welcome to Three Steps to Kayaking program where we uh, gather and help with building confidence and confidence on and off the water for your trajectory into uh, kayaking. Uh, this podcast of a part of series where we really uncover uh, a couple of key things. We share knowledge and tools and tips uh, on a, for equipment to get you on the water. Uh, you gain skills for building confidence and confidence as a sea kayaker, and we develop sea purpose personship so you can have more fun and rewarding experiences on the water safely. So today's subject is um, a progression toward being an expeditionary paddler. And super excited about this program. Um, on this episode, we're really gonna explore how a paddler in our community that we know and love went from zero to hero in a really short period of time. So let's start with um, an introduction. I'm really proud and excited to introduce uh, our guest today, Victor. Victor is a longtime track pilot. I'm gonna pin him to the screen here. You should be able to see him also. Uh, let's pin you to the first screen, Victor. Great. So, Victor, you, um, you're you a track pilot. You've paddled in the Gulf Islands in the Strait of Georgia. You've paddled in the Pacific Rim Surf Camp uh, for skills development with us. You've paddled actually out on the East Coast with one of the best coaches um, uh, in the industry out on um, in... Uh, um, Pubnico. And where is that? Uh, West Pubnico, it's uh, in the southern tip of Nova Scotia, leading into Albert? the Bay of Fee and the Argyle River. Good, awesome. Yeah, that was more specific than I was at was the top of my tongue, but uh, let's unpack that one a little bit. You've also uh, most recently attended the Pilot Summit in June of this year in British Columbia on Vancouver Island, and uh, you're currently slated to serve as a guide on our next track experience, which is a five-day moving expedition in the Gulf of California in Mexico and Baja. So um, welcome to the call, Victor. In a way of introduction, uh, tell us, where are you now? Where am I now? Uh, physically, right now, we're in yeah. Calgary, Calgary, Alberta. It's where we hail from. It's not actually where the first place you think of when you think water, I guess, but uh, that's where our story kind of starts here uh, for Michelle and I. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's we haven't moved or anything like that, but we, we recently bumped into track when they were still out in this area. And it was kind of a, I don't know, I don't, do you want me to just jump into the whole story here, Hans, or? Jump into the whole story, All sure, right. why not? You know, sure. uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of the backstory I'd like to uncover first is you're pointing sure. to it right now. Uh, you bumped into track when we were actually based in Alberta. And uh, you were you live there. Give us a little uh, backstory on what's your other gig, your day job, if you will. Right. So yeah. So I'm a I'm an engineer by trade. I work for a company that works somewhat in the oil sands, but just in mining equipment uh, in general, bulk material movement of minerals and ore on multiple places in Canada. So uh, that has me staged out of Calgary uh, as of 2014. Yes. And I've been in a number of different places. Actually, I just spent about a year in the Vancouver area as well, as you're well aware. Um, yes. Sort of living away from home for most of that time, uh, which allowed me to get in a couple fun little paddle experiences as well. Um, yeah, that's what I do for jobs. So the en engineering is sort of my, my calling, that technical, analytical type of mind that doesn't allow me to do anything without thinking it through way too much. I get that. Yeah, well, we've got a bunch of folks on the line that look like they're really interested in um, expeditionary kayaking in places like the Inside Passage, the Broughton Archipelago. Uh, Paul wants to paddle from Juneau or from Seattle to Juneau, Alaska. And, um, uh, John also would like to come from the UK and, and visit Canada. Um, Bob sounds like he'd also like to hit the Inside Passage. And um, so we've got a lot of folks who are looking to paddle in areas like you've been. So maybe this will be really helpful in that sense. Tell us now about your trajectory into sea kayaking. How did you, how did you make that discovery? Okay. Well, it kind of all started a long time ago. It's been a very limited amount of kayaking until very recently when I pulled the trigger here, uh, was it now two years ago? Yeah. Um, 
But prior to that, there was, you know, growing up, I always had a bit of an affinity for wanting to get out on the water, but doing like some half day rental or like a couple hours here, you get out on a kayak or a canoe. Um, I'd done one sort of multi-day trip with a friend in university from uh, up the Ottawa River to, through all the lock systems there. So that was like a sort of a two day paddle via canoe with him and just some rentals out in Nova Scotia area in the uh, St. Margaret's Bay, um, just kind of paddling around for an afternoon sort of thing. And then that kind of just had my brain going for many years, actually. I spent a lot of time using my um, engineering brain, thinking about how cool it would be to do a do-yourself skin-on-frame kayak one day. And at one point in time, had all the plans figured out, and I figured out how I was going to do, like, poles and pull the frame and all this crazy stuff and you guys got shelved because obviously when you're in university there's no money for that sort of thing there's no really no time to be doing crazy extra projects like that so kind of had like this thought concept that was just there for quite some time and then flash forward about a decade and working here in calgary things are pretty stable you know adult life takes hold and we're nearing our 30th birthday we we're going to do a crazy adventure together for our 30th birthday and sort of pull out all the stops and big budget type of deal and we were started looking at this kind of concept and at first we weren't thinking specifically like anything to do with buying kayaks we were just thinking like adventure trips guided adventure trips so we were looking at New Zealand two week adventure or the Galapagos Islands for like a week long adventure or any number of other locations. And so obviously the price tag, things like that are not exactly cheap. And so I started to, it kind of trickled back to this thought because some of it involved some kayaking, some of it involved kayaking and, and my brain started to turn a little bit. And I said, well, hey, you know, I'd been looking at stuff like this before and I'd actually seen the original track design years back, never really gone anywhere with it. And so then I happened to be looking, hey, well, wouldn't it be cool if we, instead of going and splurging on a crazy two-week adventure, decided to go a different way and take up a hobby and buy the equipment so we can have a crazy adventure, but also then have more crazy adventures in the future and have this accessibility to a whole new lifestyle, right? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where the brain started going. And then Michelle got on board. So we started looking together at this concept and I happened upon track again looking up for the sort of travelable kayaks I was curious where the industry had come over the last 10 years since I'd looked at it last and um, happened upon the the track 2.0 on the website as the kickstarter and I said well that's really interesting and I'd noted a number of significant improvements that made it kind of more accessible etc 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 much improved uh look to it and then i discovered that you guys were just down the road in airdrie and being an engineer and being the way that i like to do things and being very meticulous it was the sea touch feel time so it was okay. like this could work in theory time to go see touch feel and so there's a couple things that you guys do really good that i made that very easy was these discovery days or get together with a pilot and take out a kayak and test and test it out on the water go for a couple hours so we did that with one of the existing pilots uh keith Braun, i believe it's Braun, keith keith, keith Braun. Braun. yeah yeah and so he brought us out and put us through the rigors of the we weren't ready for it at all concepts so he put us on the boat and said okay before i take you out paddling here you know we're going to do the stability test and he starts rocking the kayak side you know, you know i'm in the water in about five seconds so that was pretty crazy and and then we saw a touch and feel and we liked what we saw and so we started kind of investigating we said hey so if we can sink this money into this instead and then we coupled the concept because it was always an all-in or nothing concept for michelle and i so it was yeah. either we're doing this right or we're not doing it so we ordered the two kayaks one for myself one for michelle and and we immediately kind of coupled it in with you guys via some camp experiences. So because we still wanted that adventure, but we wanted to develop the skills at the same time and cool. make it so that Michelle and I could go on some of our own adventures. And so I'd say that's probably a good chance for me to pause there is that so we made that we now we pulled the trigger. Now we have these boats on the way. 
and we're invested and we're planning to do some trips. And uh, yeah, so I'll just turn it back to you there. I'm sure there's probably plenty of awesome. things you'd like to lead into. <laughs> Victor, thank you so much. I, I totally get that. It sounds like your childhood experiences basically uh, create a lasting impression upon you. And uh, when you're looking for activities, you decided to, um, uh, of all the things you could do, was to make that investment and put it into something that was a repeatable process for you. You made a lifestyle choice and uh, really committed to that. And so it, you went from from basically no real sea kayak experience uh, to now, basically, you know, being on the roster as a as a pilot and a guide for an international expedition in Baja, that is a tight trajectory. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about the data points, you know, your specific training that helped you get there to, that, you know, brought the competence and the confidence, if you will, uh, to be in a position um, like you are right now. And um, uh, the progression specifically, what happened first? I mean, I love that Keith Braun, when he said, come on, let's, let's get this right. And he got you in the kayak and put you in the water. That's a great start. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no what, what happened after that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, like I said, the very first progression there is um, learning to build the boats. Um, so yeah. that was our first exposure to that at that time. So it was a bit of a messy process for us the first time. And Keith helped us with that. And then he put us through the paces of, OK, this is how you pull. Because at the time, I didn't even really know the basics. So it was like, you know, this is how you you have to have the in your on your spray skirt there so that you have the, 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 the handle you can pull you know, just don't be a fool, make sure your handle's there type thing. And then the, this is how you do a wet exit. So, you know, I had to learn and practice all of those things. I was completely inexperienced on that first day. Um, very little knowledge. I think I fell out three times just trying to do soft corners, trying to go around a buoy with him. And he was like, hey, try and do some turns and probably ended up in the water two or three times for sure. Cool. So working with, had so no working stability. With yeah, so working with track pilot Keith, you were first able to just get familiar with the boat and he ran you through drills. He made yep. sure you had a really good foundation. And uh, it sounds like he was really working towards helping you understand the difference between your primary stability and secondary stability of the boat so that you could really trust it, you could lean into it, um, and you could yep. use it for um, uh, um, a carving and stability tool. Um, yep. So after Keith, um, it, I remember that you... Uh, joined us on the Gulf Islands uh, trip that actually yep. did a, a circumnavigation around Laskiti Island. Uh, was yep. that the first expedition that you went on then with uh, with Trek? Yes. Yeah. So that was actually probably very shortly thereafter the, the situation with Keith was the Laskiti Islands. So we'd received our boats. We had that initial training with Keith. And then weeks later, we're doing the first travel with our boats. So, you know, the first experience with packing them up and doing them on the plane and, and transporting with your secondary bag, et cetera, and um, headed to Laskiti Island. So it was the first part of a two-part adventure on Vancouver Island. And the Laskiti Island part was a really good segue because it was in some ways more challenging because of the planning and the team atmosphere of, you know, you're actually, we're gone for five days and you're camping off of an island. So there's that adventure component to it for sure. Um, but from the skills perspective, it was a little bit lower key in terms of you had a lot more opportunity to sort of take your time, feel things out because it was long stretches, right? Yeah. It was, we get up in the morning, we, we pack down, we have some breakfast, get ready to go. And then it's a long stretch for the day. You know, you, then you're stopping for lunch, but you've got this time on the water to kind of learn and play and feel. And so I was very much into that because... Right. I wanted, I wanted to get everything I could from the experience, right? So we're going down the water and I'm practicing, like constantly practicing, like the leaning on one side, leaning on the other, trying to get a feel for the edges, that primary, secondary stability. And, and then just like with each day during Laskiti, you'd have reducing levels of kit because of the food supplies, et cetera, and less water. And so like the weight of your boat is changing. And so like from day one, where like everything is loaded to the max and you're basically sitting in the water, pretty tight to the water to the last couple of days, you know, you're much more pumped up. Suddenly you can start to do that playing with the rocker type stuff. And, 
we've had days of paddling to try and get a feel for things and been playing around. And I, I won't lie, I was the very first person in the water on that experience because I'm so silly. And I was essentially like trying to find the edge right away. So mm. it was just like, mm, I'm going to see if I can like, when I'm turning, I'm going to really try and turn hard. And then, you know, yeah. of course, up in the water and everyone got a little chance to laugh at me as I learned how to get back in. Yeah. So awesome. there was those opportunities for sure at Liskiti. And then, so it was just like a lot of paddling, finding some form um, with a forward paddle stroke, a little less worried about like turning and rough water stability. Um, but it was just kind of like calm paddling for the first four days of that trip, at least. And then we learned a little bit about uh, on the last day, we learned a little bit about sort of your backup planning and your contingency planning because we happened into a storm on the last day, which we now call ourselves the Laskiti survivors as a fun joke, but it, it wasn't so bad, but we did end up getting kind of like segued on an island and we had to go to the backup plan for the pickup off of the small beach that we found. And we waited for that barge to come pick us up there because we didn't actually make it to the final objective on day five. Yeah. Uh, so the water kind of, it was a bit of a, you know, team communication type pod work, trying to get comfortable within the group and, and measure everyone's uh, comfort level. So you got, there was a lot of experience there about testing the patience of folks and understanding what they're comfortable with and what they're not and working as a group to make sure that everyone's feels safe and comfortable as you proceed each step of the way it's like okay we'll get to this corner the waves look okay here can we make to the next checkpoint yes no what's the group think and then a constant reevaluation in that sense awesome. um, so great that way at list great and fantastic then, so it sounds like it sounds like the uh if i could if i could pause there for a yeah. second uh, the uh one of the big advantages of your introduction in terms of formal training uh as a next step is the extended expedition the moving expedition that allowed you to have time on the water with the boat to really um, work on skills with coaching that helps you really um, refine those skills so you're developing really strong habits. Now you're referencing two things uh, that are fundamental skills that I just want to share with folks on the line here. Um, I'm going to drop a, uh, a link into uh, the chat here on two skills that, it, that uh, are being referenced by Victor, that are uh, super fundamental and uh, certainly something that you would have focused on from the very first moment, like Keith start you on. One is edging on the boat, and the other is the importance of a forward stroke. It's the stroke that we use 90% of the time in a, yep. in a boat. And so we have a simple um, infographic, if you will, um, that really helps to kind of break uh, those skills. Uh, skills down so you can assess for yourself um, where you might be on that continuum of getting these fundamentals down. But I love how you've unpacked this first moving expeditions and the power of moving expedition gave you a couple of key elements. One, it gave you um, uh, those fundamentals that you got to practice over time. Um, yeah. Secondly, it, as you uh, progress in the expedition, it really helped you to start to build a sense of seamanship around risk management assessment and how, how a group makes a decision on and off the water and, um, uh, and how communication uh, happens around those. Those are super important things moving toward any expedition, very vital, important elements of seamanship. So, so I was gl super glad to hear that those are some of your key takeaways. We've got in the chat here, <clears throat> Andrea says that she's got a trip right now as an expedition plan to, um, uh, heading to, uh, it sounds like Haida Gwaii, and uh, then going to go surfing around Tofino uh, in December. Now, what I remember from your trip is that you went from this moving expedition to a base camp um, in Tofino area to focus on surf skills. Tell us about that uh, intensive training camp. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So it's kind of build, it was a great situation where we got to build on some of these more fundamental slower water moving skills over longer days to a more intensive camp actually at Tofino. So it's taking away a lot of this practice with edging and a lot of the same folks that were at the Liskiti, not just to myself, um, were at that other camp. So you take a little camaraderie, um, you've learned some of these like, you know, little tricks and I actually, as I've already used them in a couple of the events to, to treat as like training aids, 
with the like how to practice your edging really good and stuff like this um, to take it into the surf camp. So surf camp was very, very different. You know, we stayed at the camp zone. There was the yurts. So there was like sort of like indoor camping with some heat and it was time to now it was time to, you're not worried about survival. You're not worried about, okay, I have to stay dry and warm and have food and I don't want to tip the boat too much. Now it was time to go find out like, you know, what you can do in a, the kayak, what, like test your skills and really try and, and do some crazy stuff. So the basically at camp it's in a little Bay area. Um, so step one there was uh, learning how to enter and exit and surf. Basically, yeah. you're no longer in a calm zone. Now you're entering on and off of the beach with running waves. So there was definitely some, some learning there, how to get in, how to get comfortable timing the wave sets um getting pushed out beyond that initial like 200 feet so that you can get settled um so just learning and picking up some tricks there right away like uh you know because you can only sit in that surf zone comfortably for so long and the longer you're there the more risks you're exposing yourself to so it's about get in quick get in stably so you're not falling in in the surf so get in quick get in comfortably get moving then get out into the water and set yourself up for success. Once you're in that safe zone, 200 feet or so, then yeah. you can put your racer and make sure everything's all perfect because you don't have that time when you're sitting in the surf area and the, on the beach line. So, so like that's so, the so, sort of initial learning. Victor, let me ask you this question. That, that, I think that's really fantastic. That key takeaway about uh, once again, always running a risk assessment, but uh as you're coming off this this expedition uh, in the Gulf Islands and then moving to the West Coast for a for a surf skills camp, um, at that time, what did you think was the value of of you know having a, an intensive you know surf skills uh, progression uh, for you? Well, I mean, wanting to do any sort of real ocean level kayaking I feel like that just that initial surf re-entry area stop is key because the yeah. water is not super calm on the west coast of Canada or on the east coast of Canada as yeah. I've learned in both scenarios um, so just that safe entry is key but also just that ability to manage the water when you're out on rougher seas um, once you're out on the ocean water um, was what I saw so it's something that Michelle and I specifically talked about was hey we I don't want to go do things that are beyond our comfort level so it was in a controlled environment learning to up that comfort level learning to get good at some of these things and having a chance to practice being in this it's no longer a pure safe space I mean it is because you have a group and because you have at this point you're glad you have the guides around that can help you or that you know if someone goes in that needs a bit of focus and attention because there is a bit of a risk element there. Someone needs to help take care of that right away, whether it's someone else in the group that will help you get back in your boat or whether it's a situation that the leader has to come help and then everyone else needs to move into a safe zone until they're back in their boats and everyone's back on their way. And right. I'm not trying to say that it's unsafe, but it's just, there is an element of now you need that like leader to, to, to learn or progression. Um, you need that, like those small groups because you, you have to have that to make sure everyone is in is taken care of properly and that everyone can progress at their different levels and we actually did that during the pacific rim surf camp it was no longer just one group you had your small groups and depending on the progression of those particular groups you would have some people were staying they were focusing on entry and 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 exits other people were out on the water doing uh and for example myself re-entry in rough water conditions yeah, learning to do, which is something that's helped me hugely actually is um zach i can never pronounce his Zach's last name cruising thank you yeah. yeah so zach was kind enough he's seen you okay hey we've done these fun things and he said look you want a challenge and he grabbed me and one other gentleman from the group and he said okay i'll take you two guys out into the rough water and and we'll see if you can get back in the kayak or not so where he went into the swell and so you have the big the big swell happening and he's like, these are like level two, level three conditions. And it's a fairly safe space. We're well away from any rocks. And he said, look, okay, you're going to help one another do team re-entries. And then I want you guys to, so we did the team re-entries four or five times, got a good handle on it. Those are pretty good because you obviously have the other kayak to lean on. So once you have the skills down there, you learn pretty quickly that it's the same fundamentals that apply 
Um, what I learned pretty quickly though, is when you're trying to do the solo re-entries, the game changes drastically. And this is exactly the sort of experience that I was looking to get out of that camp was, okay, like if you're in that situation and help can't come to you, you need to make sure you can get back in. Whether that's you don't fall out because you get good at a role, which is something I'm still challenged by and trying to learn. For me, a personal goal is to continue to work on that. But the re-entry out of the water, we were doing the cowboy re-entries and I discovered a couple really good tricks in that heavy water scenario that I think Zach almost gave up on me I think I was at about 20 tries and I was turning blue in the face and he's like look okay okay and I was like one more one more one more so we we we're doing that re-entry and it was about that same sort of stuff in the surf area it's getting it quickly you can only survive balanced on the back of the kayak for so long so you need to get over get in shuffle yourself to the front and get yourself seated right away okay then I got it but then, you know, I got knocked out of the boat trying to get my paddle reorganized and get my skirt back on and all this stuff because your head's still in, oh, I got to do all this stuff. So again, uh, four or five more times if I managed to get in and then promptly fall back out in the swell and the waves crashing over my boat, I discovered, okay, hey, let's be smart about this. Get in, get myself to safety, then I can do everything. Yeah, got and it. So that, that takeaway for me is probably personally the biggest one that, that, maybe hour of training that I did with Zach is a huge takeaway that I've taken into just about anything else and took it to the surf later in the, the fun portion of the trip. The, the, when you're actually doing the surfing on the waves coming in, which is something that you really don't have to do. You could very easily control the boat coming in once you get the hang of it. Um, but the idea is to lose a little bit of control and have a bit of fun. The getting back in, in the wave sets and being able to do all these other things I took away and then just being able to, avoid a scenario because I know I can get back in in any condition within reason yeah. um it was a huge um a huge confidence builder for me sure. so I took that away and then I practiced that in just about every condition I could think of until I could basically get in surefire just about every time and I can get in and under you know whatever the timeline is 30 seconds or something 45 seconds and then you're back in the boat and you're back in control um so for me, that was huge. That developed a large amount of confidence for myself, but also in my ability to be confident in Michelle and I as a team, knowing that yeah. she can help with re-entry, I can help her in and she can get in a re-entry and that I'm comfortable getting back in. So if I'm the one who goes in and she can't get to me, I can always be that leader. So again, that mindset of I want to be the leader of the group um, started to kick in around that time um, and just taking it from there. And there was plenty of opportunities at the Pacific Rim Surf Camp to step up um, and we had to to tow some boats um, one time from one area to another that was not planned that was a bit of a rougher water and then they asked for myself and one or two of the others that were a bit have proven to themselves to be a bit more comfortable at this point to help and so that was a really good opportunity too because it really was a test of in that open water in that rough water can I handle mm -hmm. it can I stay calm can I stay stable um, so really 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 love that camp um, and I love the two of them in tandem, to be honest, because it was like that, like lower key expedition planning, um, getting comfortable. And then that like, okay, now we test your limits. Now we build your skills for real, um, yeah. situation at the surf camp. And that, that was a great takeaway. That was the, that was the solid introduction. That was about two weeks, pure kayaking, uh, yeah. that basically laid the foundation for Michelle and I, and I think at uh, one point yourself, if I'm not mistaken, challenged uh, myself, Duncan, and a couple others to get our Paddle Level Canada certifications, um, level one and level two, during that Pacific Rim camp. So even with everything else going on, it was, okay, we're going to try and get these targets for you guys specifically if you're willing to put the extra effort. So um, we walked away with a, that as well. So awesome, huge, huge learning opportunity. Yeah, great. Let's uh, unpack a couple of those things there, because I think you've touched on some really great pieces. One is the uh, importance of learning the surf launches and surf landings really gave you the skills and the confidence to know that you could actually go out uh, in the event that conditions build. You had the skills to bring you and your partner back to shore safely. That was one of the inspirations, it sounds like. Yep. Now, once you're out there, uh, you recognize the importance of 
really practicing in the conditions that you might actually encounter uh, and practicing until you get it. Uh, with some degree of a safety net uh, is a great way to go. The other thing you've identified that's important in a learning progression with such intensity like this is the student to instructor or guide to participant ratio is critical so that you can have really smaller group uh, experiences like going out with Zach or um, working with a, a small group in the soup zone, if you will. Um, yep. The other key thing that I'm hearing from you in terms of learning is that really recognizing that you can often take the pressure off, meaning that you don't have to do everything in the soup zone um, in terms of all the list of tasks of getting your spray skirt on, uh, getting everything buttoned up, uh, that you can move beyond the immediate accelerator uh, and then rest easy to do things in a more controlled fashion. And it sounds like that's also true when you're doing a recovery or a re-entry is that uh, you can take a breather often or find some slight shelter to tidy up, like bail the boat and get you know ready to mm -hmm. go again as long as there's no significant objective hazard like a lee shore or um, another break zone. Yep. Um, yeah, the other the other thing that I'm hearing from you that's that's unique to you, Victor, uh, that's uh, really enabled this trajectory from zero to hero in such a short period of time is it sounds like where you like to operate is recognizing where your comfort zone is and operating slightly outside of that so you have maximum learning and being careful to recognize where the edge of that is where you're no longer learning but you're in survival mode and i've noticed that about you is that you are really open to that you're receptive to that and you are attuned to where that comfort zone is how to live and work just beyond that with the intention of putting yourself in a steep learning curve in order to accomplish skills time and time again. That just seems like how you operate. <laughs> it's really fantastic to watch and it's really paid off in spades uh, for your progression. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I want to set, set the stage a little bit for folks that weren't at the surf camp. Um, it's one of our uh, flagship programs with track experiences is a base camp setting on the wild wet west coast and um, Michael knows what I'm talking about if he's paddled around Catalina Island is that there is Pacific swell <laughs> out there that is independent of the weather and uh, when it's big it can be really big and uh, um, that's what we experienced that whole surf camp we went out there and everything was double overhead uh, and we were in the most protected bay that we could be in and uh, it was still breaking on the beach in ways that we had to like find the most sheltered spot to even uh, you know appropriately get in the water and so yeah, every, everybody's comfort zone was pushed and i just love how you sort of dove into that head first you're like yeah this is <laughs> this is great so um so you did these two trips back to back um one moving expedition one focus skills camp all the time it sounds like you're at the edge of your comfort zone um, and making the choice to be at the edge of your comfort zone, no matter what the conditions were. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, now you took that and you had a period of integration uh, and you practiced on your own. Tell us what happened in there that really supported your trajectory. Yeah, so I basically, yeah, so we take away from that camp all of the things and things calmed down for a while. So I came back to Calgary and came more where can we go ca kayaking in this area um so michelle and i started looking around and you know you'd think there's a limited amount of kayaking in the area but the more we look the more i find some cool spots so uh we joined a, a meetup group for kayaking in the calgary area pretty quickly so that was a great resource to kind of meet a couple more people that are local to us to get involved with but more importantly because they know where to go so there's a couple like guys they're affiliated with the local paddle store for example that go out weekly and they're they're it's very loosely promoting whatever the the store and and, and support there um but more so yeah so we went out three four or five times that same summer um with this group to various lakes out in the Kananaskis area 
um, I've discovered that there's some, the, the upper Kananaskis Lake is, it's got some pretty, once the wave, the wind picks up, it's got some pretty good wave systems actually that developed there. Um, actually this year recently, I just took a friend out there and that day there was quite a bit of wind and we ended up in one of those fun, uh, I've got to get her back in the boat scenarios pretty quick. And so as that developed, it was drifting towards the rock, the rock area and it wasn't overly unsafe, but we just got her back in quickly, got her to safety and then moved on just to touch base on that same skill set that I continue to use on my head. Um, but uh, so just kind of exploring those areas. So, you know, paddles through, I think we went there as late as mid-October. Um, and then paddles a couple like local lakes. And then Michelle and I did a river outfit, uh, not that same year, but the next year. Um, so we were looking into that. It was kind of a little too late because again, you got to learn the river. So I didn't want to go out on the river when it was wild and I didn't know what to expect. So later in the summer paddle uh, was good when the river is a bit lower and we did a, a full day trip kind of down the, the Bow River and learned a couple things there. You know, reading cool. the river, it becomes an interesting one. It's very, very different. Reading the river, it's not an overly deep time of year. So it's try not to get grounded. Uh, you know, read the river, track it through, make sure you come through safe spaces, um, plot your route along the river. And, and just with the, as I learned at the Bay of Fundy camp, which was the other thing that I did kind of that same year, uh, was I got involved with this trip uh, through track again uh, to West Pubnico, Nova Scotia for access to the Argyle River and the Bay of Fundy and some really good experience to learn from Chris Locke here. Great. Before we unpack that Just one, um, sure. so before we unpack that one, you, uh, your trajectory in is, you, uh, of course, you got inspired, you made the commitment, uh, you did two camps back to back, and then in this integration period, you really found a community um, uh, of folks of, that were like-minded, that possibly even provided some mentorship. It sounds like you were able to access local beta uh, to really uh, help you understand what was accessible to you that you didn't even know was there. Um, in terms of areas to, uh, to make it easier for you to, uh, to be able to engage in the activity. It sounds like you took on appropriate leadership roles with peers, uh, once again, expanding your comfort zone a little bit. Um, and then it sounds like you also just made it fun, meaning that you explored, yeah. uh, you mixed it up, and that really helped to maintain your engagement with the activity um, of something that was totally accessible to you even though it was vastly different than what you were trained in. And then you, you went to another trip. Uh, it was a track trip, this one on the East Coast, another bucket list location, and set the stage for us a little bit. What was happening there yeah. in that? And what is, the, uh, and what is the, the, you know, the, the paddling scene like in terms of uh, um, currents and um, tidal ranges? Uh, What's unique to that area and then what specifically was going on help us understand that sure going into that trip yeah so it's so yeah so like a lot of lower key stuff at home so for us around the, the home area it's 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 much more like fun it's it's less intense it's just let's go for a nice paddle for the day and see some sights so then it was time for the next challenge right and just, uh continue to build the skills so signed up for the nova scotia trip fairly last minute and we discovered that there was a hurricane moving into the area at around the same time, which made for some interesting travel. Um, fortunately, everyone got in the night before the hurricane kind of landed. Um, so we all got in safely. We got to destination. We got holed up in, in the house and had a little like uh, intro to what we were going to be doing, sort of discussion of the event plan, whatever. And hey, this is what we're going to do tomorrow because of the hurricane coming in. So we actually lost the day there where unfortunately the hurricane was blowing through. So it was a stay in morning where we let the hurricane blow over and the water settle for the next day. Uh, and then it became much more of a feel it out. So kind of laid all waste to the original travel itinerary. Um, I can hardly even remember all of the places that were originally on the bucket list itinerary. But what ended up happening is we um, we ended up much less, and it was kind of part of the itinerary anyways, much less in the open ocean areas, much more in the river zones. And we did, so one day we did a similar to the Long Beach and Tofino area on the Pacific Surf Rim camp. We did a sort of a surf skills day 
um, but on the East Coast, but it, the, the skills were essentially very similar. Entry and exit and waste, staying in the soup zone, traveling laterally across the, the zone so you can get used to kind of with the waves coming to the side, waves coming to the front, et cetera. So at this point, I have a bit of a leg up on some of the other learners in the, in the camp. So just trying to help out um, and just getting better at these things myself, like just challenging myself to stay in control. Um, it was less about let's have fun and blow myself into the wave and, and get thrown out of the boat and more like, okay, can I actually control myself coming in, um, ride the wave and then get off the wave uh, in my own control. I just see someone mentioned what is the soup zone. Um, my understanding of based on the description offered to me was the soup zone is essentially that area in the first, sorry, 100 to 200 feet of the water where the waves are coming in and they're crashing and you have that undertow pulling out and you have the overtop coming in so when you're sitting in that area you've got like a lot of push and pull on the boat which is kind of going all over the place you've got bubbling water you've got waves crashing over you um and it's just not like an overly pleasant area to be in because you're still only sitting in one to two feet of water so you kind of get in that situation where you could put your paddle down to push or you if you fall in it almost could even be tricky to get out because there's not enough open water to just get out of the boat. Um, and so it's just kind of a nasty little area to be in that you kind of want to get comfortable in, develop that skill and learn how to get in boat in that area and then get free of it. So once you get free of that 100 to 200 feet, the wave sets aren't crashing like they're coming in but they're not like white capping and then crashing. And that just results in a much smoother area. That's a lot easier to just kind of sit on top of the waves and kind of just ride them. And there's a bit of a skill you develop to like get good at that, but you're just kind of riding the waves up and down as they come in. Uh, you position yourself sort of facing the waves coming in. You can kind of just hang out there versus in that first hundred to 200 feet, you kind of are in, it's not as much uh, control. It's kind of a little more chaotic. And that's why they call it the soup zone. Yeah. So you've that's identified why people end up in water trying to get out of there when they're learning. Yeah, yeah. It's where most accidents happen in the uh, in the in the in the surf zone is that uh, inside the break. So um, you've identified also, uh, Victor, that any body of water really uh, can have a soup zone, like the lake you just paddled in with your friend in Alberta, <laughs> unexpectedly had a soup zone. Now, just for folks a, a reference, you know, we've talked about two trips here already. I, I put the links to those trips uh, for the 22, 2022 version of them in the chat, just so you can uh, take a look at those trips. And I think they identify some of the intended areas to visit, um, Victor. So um, the original itinerary you're referencing is in there. Uh, right. So, okay. so you're, in the, you're in the Bay of Fundy, you're in the, the place in the world that has some of the biggest tidal ranges that exist. Um, and you're on an expedition designed to introduce you to as much challenging water as possible sequentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, rivers with huge standing waves, uh, surf zones, uh, strong currents that run at like upwards of 10 knots and uh, uh, can have white water experiences there. And so um, within that, uh, a hurricane is blowing through uh, and it sounds like your team really adapted to just like, okay, what can we do with this, given our skill set, given these conditions? What were some of the big takeaways you got from that camp um, in yeah, those so, conditions? Yeah, so that, that camp, the, 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 so that I mentioned already the day we did sort of doing same, similar surf skills. For, for me, that was a lot of repetition and skill um, building on existing skills. But the other thing that we got into was the stuff in the, the river. So essentially the, the large tidal exchanges in the Bay of Fundy create, like, as you mentioned, there's one area in the Shubenacadie River that has a massive standing wave that you could go explore. One of the things we were going to do in that particular trip was go do that. Um, however, unfortunately with the itinerary changing and being, you have to play the tidal timing. So the tidal timing for the day we had intended to do it wasn't going to work. And then also, um, just when as we developed like uh, that was one of the later days in the camp so we kind of learned okay there's there's some skill progression that needs to happen for a number of the people on this particular trip before we'd be ready as a team to take that on and so 
probably the other major thing we did, and we ended up doing it two days just based on the nature of it. But we went to the river and under the bridge area, there was the incoming tidal exchange. Um, and so there is a, a massive, massive exchange of water in that area along the river systems. Um, and it only takes probably about an hour to change the tidal levels 10 plus feet, uh, depending on where you're at. And so that just creates, uh, like the tidal exchanges in that area can be as high as 50 or 60 feet. Mm -hmm. But in that short, 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 short time window, you can go from huge flood to huge like incoming ebb. And, and you're essentially like you go from, okay, the river's flowing in one direction really fast to it's now it's coming crazy flowing in and you've got surges of water up around the pillars of the bridge and you create these really, really interesting eddy zones where you have this really, 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 really fast moving river current that's quite extreme and you're in the safety of it because you're on the downstream side of the bridge. And then in between those pillars create these really interesting eddy zones. And so it was a great chance to learn some skills about entering and exiting different types of moving water. So you have the eddy, which is actually pushing back towards the bridge in a much calmer way. And then you've got these massive like surges of waters in between the pillars. And so that you learn pretty quick. So that's what we did that day is basically is, okay, let's learn to ferry across river currents and you try and fall in and you end up downstream so it's you know you have that support team downstream it's all well planned um but you learn pretty quickly that um river currents heavy river currents don't behave the same way as ocean currents do in the sense plain is that it creates a counterintuitive sense um you have your you have your sort of wave systems coming in on the ocean water that are kind of crashing over top of you and pushing you over and you kind of want to lean into them keep your paddle moving but but lean into them and so that they can't push you in with the river systems it's the complete opposite that moving water underneath of you is trying to take the bottom of your boat and rip it out from under you so the natural instinct is to lean into the incoming water but at the second you do that even a little bit in the crazy moving water like this, you'll learn the lesson pretty quickly that that's a good way to end up in the water. You actually have to do this counterintuitive sort of teetering on the opposite hip movement to try and counterbalance that river flow underneath of you. And so that skill building is something that like, especially in that environment, it, it's, it's fantastic because it's so much trickier. It's not just like a little, like, and I've done it down the Bull River, like you have a little, a little hip adjustment and it's like, okay, I, you know, you feel for that. It's good. But in this sort of a situation, you get punished if you make the wrong move. And the really cool thing about this particular spot that we went to is under the bridge system, you have that, and then you move into the eddy and suddenly everything reverses because now the eddy is just calm. So if you're leaned heavily onto the one side, trying to control that, and you enter onto the eddy, all of a sudden the whole water system changes. Your boat wants to spin around and face the bridge and your whole hip balance, you could end up in that situation as well. So it's just a really, really good environment to play. Cool. And as you kind of got better at it, it was more fun. Um, you were getting better at it and you'd sort of try and stay in the river current and then exit to the eddy when it was safe. And you'd cross back and forth trying to get good at like, okay, heavy river current into an eddy, heavy river current into an eddy, into safety, yeah. and then reset. And then also just um, the really cool thing about that is that tidal exchange doesn't last that long. So it's only like, it's a very intense one to two hour afternoon. Very, very intense. Sure. Um, I was sore for like two, three days easy. But as that diminishes the last little bit, it starts to get a little easier but your brain doesn't yet kick in that hey it's getting a little easier so you've built a little confidence and now it's like calmed down a little bit so you really can kind of enter that wave system now river system and 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 play and feel comfortable and develop that confidence a lot more quickly and then you go back and you do it again and reaffirm that okay the things you were learning weren't just because the water was calming down it was because you were learning um but that like calmer water 
condition inside that same afternoon allowed you to sort of stop just falling out and everyone could kind of find their sweet spot where it was like for some people okay they could do it in the heavy water for other people it was they needed to wait for it to calm down before they really started to learn because the system had calmed down enough that it entered their sweet spot so that they could go in and have fun and get better and then we come back the next day and it's a really good a really good situation so yeah for me the major takeaway is learning how to deal with river systems Sounds okay, great. If answer. I can unpack that one a little bit, it sounds like the two big learnings there were, um, you know, you first identified knowing your group um, and being able to assess, accurately assess the group skills to finding what's an appropriate thing for you as an expedition to do is a big takeaway from that. Um, the other big takeaway from reading the river and the current paddlings, it sounds like is really, um, you know, by playing in dynamic water, is that you really add to the stability of the boat because those movements and those responses become reflective. And so once again, this goes back to the idea of, uh, you know, living at the edge of your comfort zone to maximize learning uh, is really great. Now, um, I want to thank Julie and uh, uh, um, Suresh for commenting on the the soup zone there, but let's reach back to also, uh, to address Julie's question to your Lesquiti Gulf Islands trip. Um, okay. She's asking specifically uh, the learning curve around packing the boat for expedition mode. Now, you had never packed a boat before going on this Lesquiti trip. <laughs> and uh, now you wind up packing the boat. You know, uh, you had to basically commit to what you're going to take uh, on a ferry it yep. was going to take you to the other side with your boat and your kit, never having actually put it in there before. Uh, Correct. That must have been daunting, um, <laughs> wondering if it was actually even going to fit in your boat. But what are some of the kind of key learnings that you took um, around your uh, progression and your learning curve of packing that you pass on to Julie um, in her progression toward becoming an uh, expeditionary paddler? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. It's a little bit more less skills, more like managing the boat sort of thing. Um, well, the first thing there was getting together with the group and distributing intelligent way your pack supplies. So you sort of like get it all together. So you have four or five people, you're all going on your expedition. Instead of everyone fending for themselves, it's much more intelligent to pack as a team, making sure that you're not putting all of one particular item with one person uh, in case something was to happen to those goods or that water. So spreading that up in a good way amongst the group, um, while also just making sure that you're packing efficiently. So putting all of the things that you need to bring together into a big pile before you go out and saying, okay, what do we really need here? Because this is your last chance to throw something back into the truck or the vehicle um, and not take it. So you sit down and you say, okay, this is what everyone brought. Okay, we have five sets of cutlery. We only need three sets of cutlery, guys type things you know like uh everyone bought four bowls you know we don't all need four bowls you know we just need to make sure we have enough for the group um we only need a couple camp stoves we don't need everyone to have a camp stove so managing that kitchenette stuff was a great way to pare that down right away there was a lot of redundancy that occurred specifically in that area um making sure that the food supplies were all packed appropriately key as well um And then specifically the way with the track because the whole track like is this empty hollow area. So like you don't want to end up with like large air pockets in anyone's bagging. You want to make sure there's lots of a mix of like some bigger things with some smaller things so that you can pack those airbags effectively so you can really get the most out of the space behind you and the space in front of you as necessary. Um, Putting the things that you don't need um, right away or in a sort of maybe for a couple of days down the road planning those towards the front of the boat because it's a lot harder to get access to that area especially in an expedition zone where you're not taking the kayak apart every time you stop you're sort of parking it on the and you're tying it off because you're going to be getting it in in the next morning so you can kind of like leave some things there if you need to or you don't need to rip into that every two seconds Um, and then having the more exposed stuff in the back so there's a couple things you learn there as well so it's beyond just packing itself Um, It's getting access and getting stuff in. And and there's a learning curve there for sure about learning how to get the seed out effectively so you can reach in there and pull something out that you might need. Um, Undoing the keter without taking 
the whole boat off the water is, is a good skill to kind of get a hang of. Um, and the, Jason has showed me a couple times and I've got a bit of a handle on it, but there's a way that you can actually take that top tube from the skin frame and you can actually pop that free and pull it forward and kind of create a bit of a hatch yeah. in the back that's... that you can then, you have a really good access space. And that's a great skill, especially if you're going to be getting into exhibition to learn how to do that effectively yeah. is to kind of get that heater open, get the combing free just in a temporary way and then lifting that tube up and getting it clear so you have that access to grab whatever you need from that back area and that's why I was saying it's really important to kind of have your more ready accessible things in that back area as opposed to the front because you don't have that option at the front yeah. the back you can get in and you can have access to it quick you can put your extra thermal layers whatever you might need in a dry bag at the front of that area um, and suddenly that becomes a lot easier to access in the track. Uh, and then yeah. you'll save, you'll thank yourself for planning that ahead. Victor, great, great, uh, Victor, great yeah. description. You've unpacked something for Julie that, um, uh, you know, we refer to often as the ABCs of kayak packing. Uh, the principle around a packing strategy is what you touched on, which is accessibility. So pack for accessibility, know what you need handy, know what you don't. The next is to pack for balance, make sure your boat's balanced. Uh, port to starboard and bow to stern. And then the third thing you touched on is compressibility, making sure you're as efficient as possible in that space. Uh, Julie, I hope that answered your question. Let us know if um, there's something else that, uh, that, that, that we could touch on there. But the other thing you really identified in terms of packing strategy, in terms of learning to be an expeditionary paddler is to identify uh, and separate what's group gear and what's personal gear. And of the group gear, what can be shared and divide it. Um, and in the personal gear, you know, what do you really need out of that? And drawing a big distinction between this is personal, this is group, everything here is shared, nothing here is shared. <laughs> and uh, now let's let's go from there and pack for efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really fantastic. Victor, we're close to the end of our time here, but I want to recap a little bit here. Um, and you're really uh, a, a great progression from uh, zero to hero, some of the key things that uh, you've put together that were key learnings and practices for you is that you've laid a really great foundation. You invested in that. You, you took the step, you made a commitment, and you just ensured that you had everything from moving expedition to really kind of advanced hard skills under your belt so that you're ready for every eventuality uh, with you and Michelle to empower you to go out on your own. Um, you did what you need to do in, a, in the shortest amount of time possible. That's really fantastic. You recognize that where you can best accelerate your learning is living at the edge of your comfort zone, just outside of your comfort zone uh, to be able to make that progression happen faster. Um, next, you've really identified that you need to practice in the conditions that might actually occur to actively build your confidence. Because it sounds like one of the key things you've done to move into being an expeditionary paddler so fast is you've actively built your confidence every step of the way. Um, and uh, part of that is continuing to practice. And the keys that you identified there were really, uh, you know, tapping into a community, find a community that's gonna help you, uh, that might have mentors, it has local beta. Um, uh, you take appropriate leadership skills uh, and roles with your peers. Uh, to be able to advance that confidence and competence um, and then to make it fun. So you actually stay engaged with it and you explore. And um, uh, then the other key things for more advanced skills, it sounds like as you're thinking about an expedition um, is know your group, know what your skills are, think about how you can assess those and make sure you're on the same page when you're thinking about what's appropriate for an expedition. Um, and also to really push that a little bit paddle in lots of different diverse water, even uh, dynamic water, so that some of those uh, movements for stability become reflexive uh, to help just broaden your range are key things it sounds like that you've done to help build your capacity as an expeditionary paddler. Um, yeah. Victor, thank you for unpacking those for us today. Curious, what are you most excited about um, with regard to this Baja trip that's coming up in November? Oh, I mean, paddling in some warm water. 
that's number one. I've yet to I've yet to do some real like open water sort of uh, warm water paddling, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm really excited to keep working on the working with others thing. Like I mean, as you said, the being in that comfort zone just above it is always great. But the thing is, is that you have to have those people around you that are in the comfort zone still so that they can ensure you you can have that feeling of safety i never want to feel like i'm outside that zone without a safety net without a blanket to ensure that yeah. with if i do do something wrong that i'm not in a bad way um that's something that doesn't make me feel comfortable or excited about kayaking at all so that's why i've sought out these other opportunities and why when i go i like to go with people who are in that peer group who i know that it's like okay if i do something they're at the same level i am they can help make sure that i get back in um, so for testing those waters and that day, I know that there's at least one or two other people that can ensure that if I put myself in a situation, I can help, they can help me and vice versa. Um, that that's key because, because you can't explore and have fun unless you, you're in that situation. Um, that's really so great. Just, so we're, yeah. So it sounds like one of the things you're really excited about is the idea that, uh, basically an expedition is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm very, very excited about with Baja in that sense, like the expedition of it, but this time being being the person that can be leaned on, right? I'm not I'm not the expert yet, but I'm I'm certainly developed some skills. I'm very comfortable helping people. I'm helpful in 90% of the conditions that we might experience uh, specifically on this trip. Um, but so just to explore and, and check stuff out is very exciting, but just to work with the group and help some other people build their skills and teach them some of the things that I went through, like, you know, how to get back in, how to find the edge, um, how to do some of the different paddle strokes, uh, how to get comfortable in those sort of eddy environments where like the water level is changing, you get behind the rock and all of a sudden the situation changes and just those like small little adjustments and staying calm with your hips and, and whatever else, because like you said, that all translates. So the more you get those, those extreme conditions, you get into the moderate condition, which is, okay, maybe a little bit test. Now it's pretty comfortable. You're, you're whipping out of a river current yeah. um, in the Bow River, for example, and the exit into the little calmer area suddenly feels very natural as opposed to something that would have been a challenge probably before. And a friend of mine ended up in the water because he didn't really know. Had to get back in and go help him go get recoup of the boat. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so just that like team environment, working with some other people, excited to help get them to where a progression that I'm at because no one should have to kind of learn alone um, with these things. And, and it's, it's way more fun to do with other people. And it gives having those people around you gives you the opportunity to try to be brave and try to experience the things for yourself. So I'm, I'm excited to give some other people that opportunity um, to lean on somebody and, and take the chance to go outside their comfort zone and try something crazy. Awesome. Um, that's so great. Little, that's so great. Right? Yeah. A little crazy. Just just to be like, hey, I'm gonna go try this wave, even though I'm probably gonna go in the water. And then you know, I know that you can come help me out. Um sorry, I Victor, just saw Gresh's comment there. What was that? I apologize. Uh I, well, I just want to say, but Victor, thank you so much for your commitment okay. to empower to empowering others. That's really fantastic. Um uh Shiresh is just acknowledging that uh, you know, as an engineer, you're quite uh risk averse always pushing <laughs> um sounds like you're, you're you know you're you're providing some inspiration um for others that might be uh have a tendency to uh for risk aversion so um thank you for that um, before we get your final comments i just want to address one question from julie she, around the packing sure. strategy she's also curious about um during the day packing and and really mm -hmm. that's the accessibility component she's wondering about deck bag solutions and julie i can tell you I'll just pipe in here because I've I do a lot, I've done a lot of moving expeditions. Um, and a deck bag is certainly a convenient way to go. Uh, track has a waterproof one that's super nice and um, has a little screen if you use a, a mobile device for navigation. It's got a map case built into it. I really love that deck bag. Um, if you uh, if you you know there are some that argue that it's best having nothing on your deck. Um, and so, uh, and there are also, if you don't have a deck bag, my solution is this. I usually what's called, use what's called a lap bag. Um, and a lap bag is super easy. I just use a really small duffel. I line it with a, with just a, um, uh, a uh, like a plastic trash bag. Uh, and 
So it instantly gives me a dry side and a wet side. Um, and it's just the small things that I need immediately accessible, snacks, sunscreen, uh, maybe a wind layer, uh, maybe a, you know, an insulative layer, uh, maybe my radio or uh, a whistle or some flares or something. And that'll just live right in my, in my, uh, in my lap um, under my spray skirt. I can even tuck it under my knees, but um, I can just pull it out and put it on my deck to get in and out and then put it right down below. That keeps my deck clean. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and it's, it's really great. So um, hope yeah. that answers your question, Julie. Um, Victor, I just want to thank you. Um, and if you have, what closing comments would you have that might help to um, inspire others now to take that step that they're thinking about of places they want to go, like <clears throat> uh, Haida Gwaii or the Inside Passage or Tofino surfing or um, circumnavigating Vancouver Island or the intercoastal waterway, all these things that uh, this audience has put down that they're aspirational about. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the risk averse engineer in me, as Suresh said, is, says, you know, plan, plan thoroughly, plan for the worst and have fun. <laughs> um, get out with other people to make it accessible and so that everything feels safe and wonderful and you can push. Um, definitely you got to go for it it's it's something that it's just like it's one of those things you have to either you just have to jump in and 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 make it an experience and that's the way that Michelle and I approached it and we don't regret it for a second um not going on a more frivolous sort of vacation um because the fun is just very different it, it's a ch it challenges you it makes it makes it more exciting so just jump in um plan plan like I said plan 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 um I'm so slow to pull the trigger on things that it's scary um as Hans is well knows and is learning every day um that is it's like everything has to be sort of thought out but you got to get it to that level so you can go and have a great time and then you get a life experience that you can cherish for a long time um and you you then then you build the skills for the next one and then the next time it's easier and it gets easier and easier each time uh and the big challenge now sounds like a fun weekend um uh with a little bit of a of, of a quick day plan as opposed to planning for a long time period so uh i i mean i'm still very new to it i'm only just touching the surface of things that you can get into um but i'm looking forward to the next adventures you know um rivers and Okanagan lakes and all sorts of stuff along Vancouver um, areas and Vancouver Island areas. And uh, I'm looking forward to all of it, but uh, it's just something that, you know, you just got to keep building the skills, keep building the confidence, get the right people around you. Um, there's a lot of guys at the track group that I've discovered are, are great people to have around you. Um, if you can afford it, I certainly obviously recommend some of these different camps is a great way to get exposure. Um, to build those skills for you and your friends and families so that you guys can go and be safe. Um, and uh, I guess one other thing is just to, just to touch on a little bit of expansion on Julie's comment. Um, Michelle loves the, the deck bag thing. She has one from Gear Lab. I know the track one is also quite good. She likes to keep it in the front of the boat. I do a lot of the same thing as you as I, if I'm gonna put anything I put in my lap. I learned the hard way that when you have to pull the spray skirt and get out, if it's not, you don't have a bit of flotation in there, you're going to lose whatever you have in your lap. So be aware of that. And uh, I kind of used to put a little bit on the back deck, but the more I learned about getting in and then working with Christopher Lockyer and his philosophy is very much like clean deck, clean deck, clean deck. Um, I've tended away towards that. So I would say if you have to put anything in the front specifically, because when you're doing your re-entries, a lot of it happens over the back deck. And so if you want to set yourself up for success with re-entries and getting comfortable getting in in any condition, um, having that clean back deck is key. So you can get up on it easily. You can slide across it easily. You can get yourself back up where you need to be in a timely manner. Um, yeah. So just that, that's my two thoughts on that, that concept. Yeah. So great. Thank you for that, Victor. And uh, uh, for everyone's um, uh, knowledge expansion here, I put a couple of links in the chat here, uh, both for some of the uh, re-entries that uh, Victor's referencing here, as well as a, another skill set on the low brace. All of these can be found um, on the Track Foundations program. It's a free foundational learning uh, with video from our pilot and resident, uh, Cole Wild. I invite you to go there, check it out. And um, 
Uh, with that, Victor, I just want to thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for sharing your trajectory going from zero to hero in uh, in just a few short years. And we're really proud to have you represent us and, and help others and uh, become empowered in the upcoming Baja trip in November. So yeah. uh, th thanks so much for that. And uh, at this point, um, uh, we're open to any kind of questions or thoughts. You can open your mic if you like, and uh, or sound off in the chat room. Otherwise, we're just uh, now officially hanging out. So uh, thank you all. Be safe on the water, and uh, look forward to see you out there. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you joining us today.